All right, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 32, not 42, that's Kevin's next week, chapter 32. <clears throat> now, you might be thinking when you hear that, it's Christmas Eve, it's the day before Christmas, which, why, aren't, why aren't you somewhere else? Why Genesis chapter 32? I mean, why aren't we in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, right? That prophecy of Christ's miraculous conception and, and birth to the Virgin Mary? Why aren't we in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where the promise of the ruler to come forth from Bethlehem is so clear and, and we typically go there at some point in time in our Christmas celebrations? Why aren't we not in Matthew chapter 1? You've got the genealogy of, of Christ there <clears throat> so clearly traced all the way up to uh, his, his birth. You've got the angelic appearance to uh, Joseph there in Matthew chapter 1 explaining to him what's going on with Mary and who this child is and how that happened and what he's supposed to do about it. Or why not Luke chapter 1? I mean, that, that chapter is so full of, of truth about the Messiah. You've got that truth coming to Zechariah about his son and his relationship with, with the Messiah. You, you've got an angel visiting Mary in that chapter. You've got Mary visiting Elizabeth and them talking about the Christ child. You've got Mary's song about everything that she's thinking and feeling now that she's been exposed to all this truth about her life and, and her child. Why not Luke chapter 2? Kevin read it a little bit ago, but why not preach Luke chapter 2? Because there you have the, the actual birth of the promised one and, and what happened, even an angel appearing to shepherds. And you've got all of these traditional Christmas passages. Isn't this the right day for one of those? Well, why Genesis chapter 32? Especially why, since we were just here, what, eight, nine weeks ago on a Sunday morning? Well, that's actually the reason I want to go back there this morning. Uh, I don't know that you've felt the frustration as much as Kevin and I have, have felt it, but when you're covering an entire chapter of Genesis each Sunday morning, it gets very frustrating for us because there's so much that we've seen in our week of preparation or longer that just has to go unstudied, it has to go unsaid, because there's just not enough time to deal with it. And that really has turned out to our advantage this morning, because going through chapter 32, weeks and weeks ago, there was a lot of material that went unsaid. We just didn't have time to deal with it, and it has left for us some tools this morning to take us back to talk about the Incarnation, to talk about this one who is God with us. Now, hopefully, after 21 years of being your pastor, you've gotten used to at least one thing. There's probably a lot of things you've gotten used to, and we're not talking about those this morning. But you've probably gotten used to us that when we're in the Old Testament, we're always looking for Christ. No matter what, we are always looking for Christ. We are pursuing Christ, and hopefully we're finding Christ very clearly, not trying to make up pictures and types and shadows, but we are finding the ones that are already there. Well, we did that last week, didn't we? We talked about Jesus being the greater Joseph. Jesus was similar to Joseph in a lot of ways, but he was infinitely better when it came to that role of saving many people alive. So we just had a, a very good example of this this past Sunday morning. Well, this morning I want to back up a little bit further. We're, we've been looking at the life of Joseph. I want to back you up once again just a little bit further, and we're going to look this morning not through Joseph's life, but through Joseph's father's life once again, and that's Jacob. So you've found Genesis chapter 32. I want to read these verses for us to get us started. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we will dive in, and, and I'll try to show you where we're going this morning. Genesis chapter 32, look at verse 22. And he, he is Jacob. Jacob arose that night, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, the man said to Jacob, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. 
Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Join me in a word of prayer. Well, Father, just as uh, Jacob saw you face to face that day, saw, I believe, the Son of God face to face that day, that's exactly what we want this morning. No, maybe we're not going to see him, we're not going to see him bodily this morning. We're not going to wrestle bodily with him this morning, but we want to see Jesus. And we know that's what you want us to see. Paul talked so much about regeneration, the new birth being us seeing your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And I don't think that's a one-time event. I think that's something that starts at that moment. And then as the Christian life progresses, we see more and more and more of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's what we want this morning. As we come to this passage, as we come to this scene and this, this person, Jacob, and this man that, that Jacob wrestled with, we want to we wanna understand um, what you want to be seen about that man. And we realize that the stakes are very high here. We understand that your glory and our joy depend on us seeing the truth about Jesus. We have come to understand that most of the messes that we create in our own lives come from the result of not seeing or not looking at Christ as we ought to. We're looking for glory, but we're, we're finding it in other places, or we're convincing ourselves that we can find it in other places. So, Father, if, if we're struggling with that this morning, we probably are. I pray that you will use this passage this morning for a correction. I pray that you will cause all other, all other things to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I pray that you'll show us truth about your son this morning, about the Son of God incarnate, the Son of God becoming a man. Why? That's what we want to see this morning. So clear out all distractions outside, inside. Give us the ability to think, to, to, to think, to read, think, focus, meditate, come to the right conclusions, and then apply those conclusions in the right ways. That might look different for all of us, but ultimately it's going to be we see Jesus. We see your glory in Jesus And that's going to impact the way we carry out our lives. That's what we want. So, Father, do that. We believe you can. I believe you will through the power of your Holy Spirit using your word. You do that. And I pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so coming to chapter 32, it would be good for us just to kind of review, just reset the stage. We've gone on from this. We've we've come to Jacob's son, Joseph, and we've had our mind there for several weeks now. So we, we probably need just a little recap of what was going on leading up to Genesis chapter 32. So you remember very well, Jacob was the younger twin of Isaac and Rebekah. And you also remember that even before Jacob and Esau were born, God had told Rebekah specifically that the older son, Esau, was going to end up serving the younger son, Jacob. We also know that Isaac, Daddy Isaac, favored the older one. Even though I think he knew what God had told to to Rebekah, Isaac actually favored his older son. Had reasons for that. I mean, his older son was a man's man. He, He was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter, and he was a very good cook. Evidently, he brought his father some of, the, some of the game that he had killed. He prepared very good meals for his father. And because of that, his father treated him as his favor. But we also know the, the, the opposite was taking place from mom. Mom preferred, favored Jacob, the younger son. We know how Jacob blackmailed his brother Esau out of his birthright. Remember, Esau came out of, out of the field one day, and he was just absolutely exhausted, and he was famished, and, and Jacob was, was fixing a pot of stew, and Esau wanted some of that so badly that he was willing to make a trade, and, and we know Jacob tricked him out of his birthright that day. We also know that Rebekah and Jacob got together, and they tricked Isaac out of his blessing that was supposed to go. It was intended for the older son, Esau, but Jacob actually ended up stealing it for him when his father was old and and blind and, and couldn't really tell the difference. So we know Esau reacted very strongly to that. He hated his brother for, for all of those thefts, and he plotted to kill him after their father Isaac was dead. 
So we know mom got scared over that. Mom sent her favorite Jacob away so that Esau couldn't kill him. And she sent him away to her brother Laban's home way up to the northeast, four, five, six hundred miles away. Sent him up there to, to be protected, but also hopefully to find a wife while he was up there. And she was successful. She protected him, and we know how Jacob saw his cousin Rachel and fell madly in love with her pretty much from the very beginning. We also know that uh, his uncle Laban promised Rachel in marriage to him, work for me for seven years, work on my farm, be a laborer on my farm, and I will approve of your marriage to my daughter, Rachel. We know come wedding night, he pulled the switcheroo, and it wasn't Rachel there in the honeymoon suite. It was her sister Leah instead. So that didn't stop Jacob from loving Rachel. He still wanted her to be his wife. And so he made another deal with Uncle Laban. Laban promised, okay, well, I'll give you Rachel too, but you're going to have to work another seven years for me before I'm going to sign off on the marriage contract for her as well. So Jacob loved Rachel so much. He was very willing to do that. That's exactly what happened. And we know there were other ramifications that that came out of this as well. Now you've got two wives. You've got sister wives, literally. And we know how much they, they envied each other, they were jealous toward each other, and they, they used and abused uh, Jacob as their husband to, to get more children for themselves, to one-up their sister. And by the time all of that was over with, we know Jacob ended up with 12 sons and one daughter and a whole mess that came out of that as well. Now, when we come to, to Genesis chapter 32, we are 20 years after Jacob originally left his home after tricking Esau, and he ran for his life. We are 20 years on down the timeline at this point in time. And now Jacob is heading back home. He's been up in Haran, up in Padan Aram, and now he's turned around and he's come back down to the southwest, and he's headed back down toward Canaan, toward his father's house. He's headed back home. There's only one problem with this. What is it? It's not a thing. It's a person. It's Esau. And that's not a small problem either. Because remember, last time Jacob had seen Esau, it was, I very clearly know, what Esau wants to do with me. He wants to kill me. That's his intention. And this is where we re-enter this story. We in Genesis chapter 32 have found ourselves back at the night before. It's kind of like the eve of this big reunion with Esau. At this point in time, Jacob didn't know what that reunion was going to look like, or he may have thought he knew what that was going to look like. But here we are the night before, and we enter chapter 32 at that spot. So come back to the text with me and look at verse 22 through 24, and I just want to point out some things as we move down through this. And remember, we are looking for Emmanuel. We are looking for the one who is God with us. That is the focus. That, that He is the main character in this story. So keep that in mind as we read these verses. Verse 22 again. And Jacob arose that night, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He's back down at the Jordan River now, getting ready to head uh, west over into the promised land. And, and so you've got all these tributaries that are flowing into the Jordan River. One of these fords was just one of those tributaries. Verse 23. He took them... His his family and his servants, and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. Stop there. We'll get to the rest of the verse in just a second. So it's pretty clear to me that Jacob did this on on purpose. He he wanted to be alone. He, He sent the rest of the family, his servants, everything he had, he sent them on ahead, and he stayed where they were at that moment. So he made this decision. He wanted to be alone. You say, well, why? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, we can make a lot of different guesses. Maybe at this point in time, Jacob is worried sick. I mean, he's headed toward Esau. Again, in his mind, he remembers 20 years ago. And so maybe he is worried sick, but he doesn't want his family, doesn't want his servants to see how terrified he is. And so he sends them on ahead so he can stick around there and and deal with this for a little bit. Maybe he sent them on ahead because he just needed some time and space to be alone to think without distraction. Maybe he wants to to, to look ahead to the next day and and, and run through all the potential scenarios. What might happen? What might Esau try to do? How can I deal with that? How can I prevent it? How can I react to it? 
Maybe this is what's going through his mind. He can't do that with, with 12 sons and a daughter and, and sheep and, 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 and goats and, and oxen and camels and servants all around him and managing all of that stuff. I can't think straight. So you guys go ahead, and I just need some peace and quiet. I don't know. Whatever it was that Jacob intended by sending them all forward, things did not turn out the way he planned that night. He wasn't alone. He wanted to be, but he wasn't alone. And as for peace and quiet... No, that didn't happen either that night, did it? Look at verse 24 again. Jacob was left alone, or so he thought, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, here we've got the main character in this story. The main character is not Jacob. Don't miss this. Any more than when David goes out to fight Goliath, David is the main character. Don't, don't ever miss that in Scripture. The main character is always God. And when you see this man showing up to wrestle with Jacob all night long, the main character has now walked on the stage. But who is this? It's a, it's a man. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So evidently, this looked like a man. And clearly, he felt like a man, right? I mean, you don't wrestle with a ghost. You don't wrestle with a phantom. This is not just Jacob having a dream and wrestling in his dream. This is a real man. He is wrestling. He is grappling with this man all night. And at a certain point in time in the morning, the man says to him, let go of me. You can only let go of something that is physical that you've, you've latched onto, right? So this is a real man. But who is he? Is this just some thief? robber who's always out on the prowl looking for somebody to take advantage of, and he found Jacob alone and says, ha-ha, I've got a sucker. He's, he's got his back turned. I'll jump on him right now and steal what I can get from him. Was this possibly one of Esau's scouts that he had sent out ahead to locate Jacob and all of his entourage that he had heard was coming his way? I'll send out some scouts to, to find him, and then they can come back and tell me exactly where he was. And maybe this is one of the scouts who said, well, I found him. I don't want to leave. He might go off somewhere else that we can't find him. And then when Jacob wasn't paying attention, he jumped on him trying to assassinate him on behalf of his master? Well, the answer is no. Probably in your translation, man in verse 24, man is capitalized, right? So it's pretty clear that the translators thought they knew exactly who this man is, right? And we know why. If you'll glance down at verse 28, the man speaks to Jacob and says something that, that leads us to that, that conclusion. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men. And by the time this is finished, there's no doubt in Jacob's mind who this was either, right? I mean, if you glance down at verse 30, Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So clearly this man is God. I don't, there's no debate in my mind about this. This, this is God. This is, this is God as a man. This is God who, who has eternally been spirit, bodiless, immaterial, who has now come to Jacob as a physical, material man. Again, this is not an angel. This is not an apparition. This is not a ghost. This is not a figment of Jacob's imagination. This is not a dream where he had characters in his dream that were just so lifelike that, that it just looked exactly like a man. No, this is a living, breathing, material, flesh and blood human. But at the same time, he was God. He didn't stop being God just because he was human. He was both at the same time time. And you say, well, how can that be? And I say to you, I don't know either, because that's not natural. We, we don't see that on a daily basis, do we? We see human beings, and they're just human beings. And we don't see God in some form, physical form right now. God took a physical form, and he's still in that physical form, but he's not here in that physical form right now. So this, this breaks all of our rules. This defies all of scientific law. This is not going to be found in a biology textbook. If you go sit down with Nate right now, he teaches anatomy and physiology. He has not covered this in one of his chapters in, in A&P. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. You don't recreate this in a laboratory. This is not scientific. This is supernatural. This is miraculous. And this is incarnation. 
This is the very uh, illustration, this is the very outliving of that word incarnation. Now, this is not the only place that we've seen this in history, is it? Back to those verses I mentioned to you earlier, Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin, a female human being, shall conceive and bear a son, a human being, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Call that human being God with us. Micah 5, 2, out of Bethlehem, which was a little community, a little village of human beings, out of Bethlehem will come the one, the one human to be ruler over Israel, whose goings forth are from everlasting. There is no human being whose goings forth are from everlasting. That's God, but he's a human being who was born and raised from Bethlehem. So we see this all through the Old Testament. When you come to the beginning of John's gospel, this is the very thing John is not not wrestling with. He's just trying to explain. When he said, you know, the the word, um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The word we know is Jesus Christ. He was there at the beginning. He wasn't created at the beginning. He was already existing at the beginning. And actually, everything else was created through him. All other life has its source in him. But John says, He was God. Even at that point in time, he was God. And then down in verse 14, he said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I think we do ourselves a disservice when we try to explain the word became flesh. We make it sound like God just occupied a human body. It's almost like when we talk about demon possession. A demon comes in and takes residence in a human body. That's not this. It's nothing like that whatsoever. What John was saying is that the Son of God was made flesh. He was made a human being. He came into existence as a human just like everybody else since creation. He lived among men, right beside all men, with men just like all all the rest of the human beings that were around him because he was just like the rest of the human beings who were all around him. This is what Paul was explaining to the Philippians in chapter 2, where he humbled himself and took on the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of man. Like every other human being, that's what he was. Isaiah 53 talks about him looking no different. He's he's just ordinary. He's run-of-the-mill, just like every other human being. And this is incarnation. This is the Son of God becoming a human being. Jesus described it best himself when he said, I and my Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Wait a minute. I'm looking at a human being, and it's just like looking at the Father? Absolutely. Because they share the very same essence. There's no difference in the nature that was in Jesus the man and what is in God the Father. Holy divine, eternally holy and divine, and yet Jesus is a man fully, completely a human being at the exact same time. Fully God, fully man, the God-man. So when we come to chapter 32 of Genesis, and we find this, this man who is also God, I want you to understand that this man we're seeing here is, just, is not just a type of the Son of God incarnate. He's, this is not just a picture of the incarnate Son of God. This is the Son of God here in Genesis chapter 32. This is the Son of God coming as a man 1,700 years before permanently becoming the man, Jesus Christ. And what I want to focus on from chapter 32 this morning is not the what of incarnation. We're not going to try to figure out this morning how God becomes a man because that, that's a fool's errand. It will, it will never happen. We will not have enough discussion time to arrive at a conclusion where we all say, oh, I get it now. No, it's a miracle and we are supposed to look at it. We are supposed to appreciate it. But there's something else I want us to see from chapter 32. It's not the what, it's the why of incarnation. What was God's reason for the Son becoming the man, Jesus? Why, God? Why, Father? Why did you do that? Why did you send your Son to this earth as a human being? And I think we can better appreciate that by understanding why he did something similar to that here 
in Genesis chapter 32. Why did he send the God, the Son of God, to Jacob here in Genesis chapter 32? So come back to, to, to verse 24 with me. Let's pick up where we left off. Genesis chapter 24, then Jacob was alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So here we got a wrestling match, an all-night wrestling match. Whose fault was it? It was God's. Notice Moses said, the man wrestled with Jacob. He didn't say, Jacob wrestled with the man. God instigated this fight. Yeah, no doubt, Jacob seemed to be a willing participant here, didn't he? But God was the one who picked the fight. It was God who came to Jacob and jumped on him first. And we can go further with this. God was obviously the one who wanted the wrestling match to go on all night. You say, well, well how do you figure that out? Well, because God touched his hip and put it out of socket in the morning, and the wrestling match ended pretty quickly after that. Couldn't, have God have, couldn't God have touched his hip two seconds into the wrestling match, and it would have been over right there? If this is God that Jacob's wrestling with, God could have broken every bone in his body. God could have paralyzed him. God could have caused him to have a stroke on the spot. God could have killed him right there, wrestling match over, one second in. So God chose to let this go on all night. God chose to let Jacob wrestle and, and struggle all night long. Why? I mean, why didn't he end it two minutes in, one minute in? Why, why let that thing go on all night? Well, I think we find our reason in verses 26 and 27. And he said, Jacob said, let me go. Or, or the God man said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. All right, so, so God has let this go on all night long. Imagine how exhausted Jacob was. Even if you are a professional wrestler, to wrestle with someone else all night long, by morning, you are absolutely worn out. On top of that, now Jacob also has a dislocated hip. You ever tried to do anything with a dislocated joint? We were in basketball practice one time when I was in JVs, and we were just throwing chess passes to each other. The guy standing next to me caught a chess pass, and he said, oh, and I looked over, and his pinky was like this. And so he didn't keep throwing chess passes. He didn't practice the rest of that day. They ran him back to the locker room, and you know what they do, pull that thing out and push it back over and taped it together, and they let him take the day off after that because of his dislocated finger. Go talk to Johnny right now. See if Johnny wants to wrestle with you or try to run a race with you right now. No. So here, Jacob has been wrestling all night long. He's absolutely exhausted. God dislocates his hip, yet Jacob is still holding on to the man, refusing to let go. Why? Why is he so persistent? Why is he so insistent? Well, because he wants a blessing from this man. Nothing else will do. He will not stop wrestling until he gets this blessing that he wants, but what kind of a blessing is it? Well, we have to remember what's going on all around Jacob at this point in time. Where is he going? He's headed back to Canaan, back to the promised land. He's got everything with him that he owns. He's got his, he's got his wives. He's got his, his, his wives' maid servants. He's got all of his children, all of his servants, all of his flocks and herds that he had accumulated back under Laban, his, his uncle, all of that. He's now moving on the way to Canaan. Remember the last words that Esau probably spoke to him? I don't know that these were the words, but this was the impression that Jacob got from him. I'll get you. You're a dead man. That's basically how it was left between Jacob and Esau. And now he has heard Esau is headed his way. And who's he got with him? 400 men. What are you supposed to assume? My brother wants to kill me. We've never made amends. I'm heading back his direction. I have sent servants to him telling him that I'm coming, and now here he comes toward me with 400 men. What's going through Jacob's mind? We don't have to guess about that. We know all the things that Jacob did in this scene to try to prevent or minimize what he thought was going to happen to him. Esau's headed my way. He's got a lot of hurt on his mind. He's got one intention on his mind. So what can I do? to try to minimize the pain that's coming my way, the loss that's about to come to me, what can I do to try to prevent it or minimize it 
or even bounce back from it after it happens. And so Jacob is taking matters into his own hand here to try to provide perfect per- protection for himself and his family. Now, to his credit, if you glanced back at verses 9 through 12, and we're not going to read them, Jacob did pray. Jacob did go to God and say, um, help me, <laughs> help me. You know what's going on here. I can't fight off Esau and these 400 men. Please help me here. So he did pray, he did beg for God's protection. But then you have to ask the question, okay, after he prayed, did he rest easy after that prayer? Did he say, okay, I prayed to God. I'm going to wait on God now. I believe he's going to protect me and, and, and bring us all the way back to the promised land. Well, no. You know, Jacob took all kinds of uh, other precautions. He split his everything that he owned. He split his family into different groups so that Esau couldn't attack them all at the same time. And maybe if he attacked this group, the other groups would have time to run and, 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 and get off to, to protection and freedom somewhere else. So he took that precaution. We also know Jacob sent wave after wave of gifts Esau's way. Maybe if I send him a bunch of goats. Maybe if I send him a bunch of sheep. Maybe if I send him a bunch of camels, he'll, he'll reconsider and say, well, you know, I could use some more camels, and, and if I can get those out of my brother, then I'll back off a little bit. This is what Jacob was obviously hoping by sending all of those gifts ahead. So it looks like Jacob is trying to hedge his bet here. It looks like he's trying to take matters into his own hands. He's trying to provide his own protection. And even when God responds to his prayer by coming directly to him, So here's Jacob alone, and God comes to him. Jacob has prayed to God for help. God shows up. You would think at that point in time, Jacob would be convinced, okay, I don't need to do all this stuff. God's here. God will take care of me. Is is that what happened? Is that how he reacted? No, not at all. We see Jacob then start wrestling with God to try to get what he wants from God. I prayed to you, took all these other steps to try to provide protection for myself, and now that you're here, I'm going to wrestle this out of you. I'm going to overcome you until you have to give me what I want. You have to protect me. You have to bring us back to the promised land. Well, did all of that work? Well, look at verses 27 and 28, because it looks like it did. Sounds like it did. Verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Sounds like Jacob got what he want, right? Sounds like he, he was successful. All of this, all of this manipulation and scheming and, and bribing and now wrestling with God sounds like he ended up getting what he wanted, right? He's prevailing all the way around. I mean, you remember Jacob had prevailed with Esau way back when. Did he, did he prevail? He wrestled with him. Did he prevail? He sure did. Got his birthright. He wrestled with his father, Isaac. Did he win there? Sure did. Got Isaac's blessing for himself rather than Isaac giving it to his brother, Esau. Jacob had struggled with his uncle Laban, right? Did he win there? Well, this is proof that he won there. Here he is coming back to Canaan with all of Laban's, with both of Laban's daughters, with all of Laban's grandchildren, with a lot of Laban's Laban's flocks and herds, so it looks like he prevailed against Laban as well. And now he has struggled with God all night long, and within hours of this, Esau's going to come to him and fall on his neck, weeping and kissing him because he missed him so badly, Not, not only not killing him, but even offering to help bring all of his stuff back to Canaan and to their father Isaac. Looks like... Jacob prevailed with men and with God, doing everything his own way. But is that really what happened? Does it seem strange to you that that God asked Jacob's name here? Did he need to ask Jacob's name? This is God. He's omniscient. He knows everything, right? And we already know how much God knows about Jacob. It was God that gave Jacob to Isaac and Rebekah. It was God who said, this is exactly what's going to happen with these two kids. Jacob's going to end up ruling over Esau, his older brother. So it's not like God's fishing for information. It's not like God showed up that day and said, who are you? What are you doing here? You've got to tell me something about yourself. You've got to bring me up to speed. That's not it at all. So why did God ask his name? I think. It's because he wanted Jacob to say out loud 
not only who Jacob is, but what he is. Because back then, names meant something. People didn't just pick names because they sounded good. Well, if we put this first name and this middle name together, it's got a really good ring to it. Or we need to pick a name that nobody else has got. I'm tired of hearing John and Fred and Frank, and we got to pick something very unique. None of that. Names meant something. Children were given names to, to express something. Maybe what that parent wanted their child to become one day. Or maybe even what they were already seeing out of that child when it was born or when it was young and starting to grow. Maybe they were already seeing traits that they would bring out with the name that they gave to that child. What's the name Jacob mean? Remember? Deceiver. Supplanter. This will be a selfish manipulator. That was the name Jacob. Did his life back that up? <laughs> yeah, you better believe it backed that up for sure. But he says, what's your name? Jacob comes out with it. Jacob says his name, and as soon as Jacob says his name, the whole script gets flipped, just like that, like, like, like somebody flipped the switch. You go from God saying, what is your name? My name is Jacob, and then automatically, right away, God changes directions by changing Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. Now, what does that name mean? Well, very interestingly, the name, the name Israel means God overfights. God overwrestles. God overrules. That's your new identity. You just said, Jacob, that's been your identity up to this point in time. Okay, you've said it out loud. You have admitted what you not only uh, are named, but what you actually are. And now I'm changing it just like this to God over rules. This is your new identity. And the evidence in this scene is so, um, is so heavy, it is so clear that Jacob's new name is now Jacob's new reality. This is impossible to miss. And let me, let me kind of bring you through this so that you can see what I'm talking about. Again, back to, did Jacob get what he wanted here? Did Jacob get protection from Esau? Was Jacob able to return to Canaan in peace and prosperity after this? Yes, absolutely so. But why? How did that happen? Did Jacob make that happen by all of his scheming and bribing and wrestling with, with God? Did, did, did he get protection for himself that way? Did he get safe passage back to Canaan that way with his efforts? No, he did not. What's the proof? Well, those bribes that he sent to Esau, what happened with them? Esau rejected them. I don't want your bribes. I don't want your camels. I don't want your goats. I got goats. So his bribery toward his brother didn't work. And what happened wrestling with God all night long? <laughs> How does Jacob leave the scene here? Limping. He can barely walk. So he comes out of his wrestling match with God, maimed and, and um, not paralyzed, but he was having a very hard time going through life physically after this, after having wrestled with God to get what he wants. So the evidence is here that Jacob's selfish efforts had not worked either with men or with God. But we've got to remember something else that's going on at the same time. And I want you to put a finger in chapter 32. Turn back just a few chapters to chapter 28 with me. Genesis chapter 28. Here we are probably on the first night that Jacob was running from home. He has tricked his father out of the blessing. Esau has found out about it. Esau is hopping mad. Esau is making death threats. Mama says, Jacob, you got to run. You got to run for your life. You got to get up there to Laban where you'll be safe for a while. And so here's Jacob out on the road, probably the first night away from home. And you remember what took place? God comes to him in a vision. And here is part of that vision. Look at verse 13. Genesis chapter 28, verse 13. The Lord speaks to him in this vision. And behold, the Lord stood above it, that ladder going from heaven to earth, earth to heaven. He stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. This is still in the land of Canaan, that promised land. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. 
You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Interesting, huh? Where is Jacob in chapter 32? Headed back to the land of Canaan? God has made promises to him, big promises. I am with you. I will preserve you and protect you. I will bring you back to this land. God has already spoken this to him. At Bethel, that, that pl- God is here. This is, this is the gate to heaven. This is where God comes to earth. And, 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 and this is the promise that God made to Jacob in this spot 20 years earlier. Turn to chapter 31 on your way back to 32. Just drop off in 31 and look at verse 11. Here is just about the time when, when Jacob's about to round up all of his stuff up there with Laban and, and head back south. So he's, he's made up his mind, we're going to go. And once again, in a vision, God appears to him and, and says some more important things. Chapter 31, look at verse 11. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. I'm the God that showed up to you at Bethel and made all those promises that night. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. So think about what's going on here after knowing those previous appearances by God, those previous promises by God, those previous instructions by God. You've got in chapter 32, the God-man is making Jacob say his name. He has changed his name to Israel. Why? Because he wanted Jacob to see that he was getting what he wanted. He was but not because he schemed and not because he deceived and bribed and fought to get it for himself. He was getting what he wanted here because God had already promised it to him. And God was fighting for him to give him what he wanted, which was what God had already promised to him. Think about it. It was God who had protected him originally from Esau so that he didn't die while he was still back home. It was God who had given him his two wives and all of those children. It was God who had given him all of those speckled and streaked and spotted goats and lambs and and all of those herds and flocks that he accumulated. It was God who was changing Esau's mind at that very moment so that Esau would spare Jacob and help him back to the promised land, not restrict him, not forbid him, not stand in his way, not kill him and half of his servants and family, but help him on his way back to Canaan. God came as a man to Jacob to do for him what he had already promised to do and to stop Jacob from trying to do it for himself. And that's why when you you go back to chapter 32, I read verse 31. I mean, that's how that scene has to finish up. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. And I can't think of any better metaphor, any better symbolism than that. Here you've got Jacob. He's walked to that point in time. He has come to that place with thoughts on his mind about how he's going to get what he wants, how he's going to deal with Esau how he's going to overcome Esau, how he's going to protect all of his stuff and get all of it back to the promised land. How am I going to do that? And he's right there at that, at that ford that night, figuring all that out and working it all out. He walked there. Now he's limping away from that spot, which is a beautiful metaphor for there's the old Jacob, the old deceiver, the old supplanter. We saw what happened after this. Did he still try to deceive and work things out his own way at times? He did. There's no question about that. But what else did we see about Jacob after this? Here you had a man at this point then that was starting to trust God. He was starting to see God has made promises to me. And God is big enough to fulfill those promises. He is 
faithful. He is true to his word. These promises are not just to me. They started with my grandfather Abraham, then Isaac, then my own father or great-grandfather, then my own, my own father Isaac. I'm getting my generations messed up, but you understand. God will provide. God will do what he's promised to do for me. And old Jacob is limping to be old Jacob still, but now you've got Israel who believes that God over-wrestles. God over God overrules on behalf of his chosen people. So I told you the God man who came to Jacob here by the river is not a picture of Christ. This is not a this is not a type. This is not a shadow like Joseph was. No, this God man is the very same son of God in another incarnate appearance. And the picture that I want us to see here this morning is not in the incarnation, but in the reason for the incarnation. 17 years after Genesis, 1700 years after Genesis chapter 32, God the Son came into this world again as a man, Jesus of Nazareth. Fully God, fully man at the same time. Just like the God man who wrestled with Jacob all night long there by the river. We know why. God the Son came as a man that day, that night, to Jacob, right? But why did he come as Jesus? Why did the Son of God become incarnate? Why did he take on humanity and become a human being, Jesus of Nazareth? Well, there's an easy answer to that question. If we had gone to Matthew chapter 1 this morning, we would have seen it. The angel came to Joseph. He said, you need to name that child Jesus. Why? Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. There's the easy answer. Why the Son of God become a man? Jesus. To save his people from their sins. But what are those sins? And how exactly would he save them from those sins? Well, I want you to leave Genesis chapter 32 and go way to the New Testament, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want to show you a couple of verses that the Apostle Paul wrote here to the church in Colossae. He was trying to explain to them not not the wonder of what incarnation is, but why the incarnation. Why the Son of God becoming Jesus of Nazareth? What, what, What produced the need for that to take place? In Colossians chapter 1, I want you to look at verses 21 and 22. Paul's writing to these people who are now believers, but he's describing who they were before they were born again, before they trusted in Jesus Christ. And this is the perfect description of all of us in this room this morning who have a before and an after. Before we were regenerated, before we were born again, what were we like? Well, here it is, and it ain't pretty. Verse 21. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. It's not pretty, is it? We were alienated, which means separated. We were cut off from God. And you said, well, why? How? How did that happen? And the answer is, as Paul explains right here, because in our minds, we thought We desired, we planned in our mind things that we wanted to do, works which were actually wicked, works which made us enemies of God. That's not Pastor Mark's words. This is exactly what Paul is saying here. Before we were regenerate, we had thoughts going on, lots of thoughts going on. And those thoughts, those desires that turned into plans were to do certain things in our life that God considers to be wicked things. Things that actually made us enemies of God. Like you've got two armies who hate each other and over here's one side, over here's the other side, and they both want to kill each other. That's what these thoughts in our minds producing wicked works, that's the relationship that it caused with God. That sounds awful, doesn't it? And, and I rarely talk to anyone when we start talking about sin who, who, who sees themselves this way. They never say, I am, I am awful. You just don't know how awful I am. It happens once in a while, but, but most people are, well, everybody makes mistakes. You know. 
We all do things wrong once in a while. Nobody gets it all right. But no one would, would look at themselves and describe themselves this way. Enemies of God? Doing wicked things? I mean, what is Paul talking about here? And my answer would be, Paul is describing Jacob's life here. I mean, this is a perfect description of what we have seen from Jacob in all of our study of Genesis, but even what we've reviewed this morning. I mean, think about it. God had promised Jacob that God would bring him and his family back to Canaan for a life of prosperity there. I read the promise to you, one of the promises back in in Genesis chapter whatever that was, 28. It's very vivid language. I mean, if God says that to someone, you should get excited and eager and, wow, what kind of life is that going to be back in the land of Canaan? God made those promises to Jacob. Jacob wanted that life of prosperity in the promised land, but he didn't believe God's promise. Jacob thought he had to get that for himself his way. So what did he do? He lied. He schemed. He tried to bribe and manipulate. He even wrestled with God to get that for himself. And all of that means Jacob was acting like God's enemy. All of that unbelieving, all of those self-serving works that he conjured up in his mind is Jacob saying, I don't believe you. I want it, but I don't believe you'll do it. Maybe he thought, I don't believe you can do it, but I believe I can do it, and I will do it my own way. There's God, here's me, we're on opposite sides of the fence. This was Jacob's life. I mean, not only did he think it, he carried it out acting like God's enemy. But let's not keep picking on Jacob too much here. What about us? Were we any different? I mean, think about this for just a second. This is so important. What is it that all men want most? If I told you to pull out a piece of paper right right now and write down the answer to that question, all human beings share something in common. What is it that all men want most? What is it that's behind or underneath all of the the relationships and the things and the experiences that we all long for and that we chase after all the time? What is it that's underneath that? Well, here's the answer. We all want a life of prosperity. We all want full, lasting pleasure. We all want happiness. We want joy. We want peace. We want freedom from fear. I mean, that's that's our commonality. I don't care who you are, where you've come from, or what age you are, what generation you grew up in. That's still what's underneath all of our desires and our pursuits. Is there anything wrong with that? Is that sin? No, that's not sin. I'm not standing here saying this because I'm saying, well, that is sin. There is nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, isn't that what God promised to Adam and Eve in the garden? Didn't he promise them an unending life with all of their needs and desires met? Paradise, right? I mean, it was just assumed as long as you obey me, you'll get paradise for, for, forever and ever and ever and ever. But what happened? They didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. They didn't trust God to give them that life his way. They believed that they had to make it happen for themselves another way. So they ate the forbidden fruit. Oh, the fruit on that tree, if we eat that, it'll get even better. We're missing something now, but we can have it if we just go do that. They didn't believe God. They didn't trust him. So they ate the forbidden fruit thinking that that would give them the life that they wanted. What was the result? Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. They became alienated and enemies in their mind by wicked works. They started dying at that very moment. They had to be kicked out of the garden for their own protection. Then they passed that depraved nature down to all of us. And so what do we do? We just follow in their footsteps. It's what comes naturally to us. Unbelief, rebellion against God, even idolatry. You say, I didn't have any statues up on a shelf. I didn't burn incense to anything. I didn't didn't name any other God. I wasn't a Hindu. Well, no, no. But still, in our relentless pursuit of paradise our own way, we sent the very clear message to God, we don't want you to be God. Who do we want to be God? Me. I'll be God. I'll run my own world. 
I know the promise that you made. I know you've promised me a life of, of, of prosperity, all my needs and all my desires that, that I could ever want. They'll all be fulfilled your way. But I'll do it my way. I'll be in charge. I, I'll take the bull by the horns. I'll make the rules. I'll, I'll figure out how to do this my way, which is actually better than your way. I'll trust me, not you. What is that? That is idolatry the very core of idolatry, replacing God with something else. And probably the worst form of idolatry is replacing God with self. Adam and Eve did it. Jacob did it. Guess who else does it? Jacob needed to be saved from that very thing, and so do we. And just as the God-man came, Genesis chapter 32, to save Jacob from that, he's the only one who can save us from the very same thing. Paul said it here, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. The Son of God came in a body of flesh, a real man, just like us, to live and to die in our place. You see, that sin that I just described to you for most people in the world just doesn't seem like a big deal. I didn't kill anybody. It's not like I went and kidnapped somebody. We don't see it as as such a big deal, but to God, it is a big deal a really big deal. And the proof of that is in the penalty for it. The wages of sin is what? Death. That crime earns the death penalty from God. And God is a righteous, just God. He can't say the wages of sin is death, but, oh, I'll forgive that today. You you don't have to die for that sin. That one's not bad enough. Only these sins, uh, you know, earn that kind of a death. But no, all sin earns the death penalty, and God is a just God, that penalty has to be paid by a human being. Either we pay for it ourselves for all of eternity, or there has to be a substitute that God approves of. Has to be a human subject, substitute that God approves of. And there's only one. There's no other human being that's ever walked the face of the earth who didn't have his own crimes to pay for. God had to become a man, fully man, to live that righteous life, to go to that cross, to pay for sins, not his own, not sins that he ever committed, but to pay for the sins of his people. And it's exactly what he did in a body of flesh. And when he died on that cross, our guilt was erased from our record because he took it on himself and paid the penalty for it. But we had another problem too. It wasn't just that that legal death penalty that we earned with our idolatry and our rebellion. No, we had another problem, and that was that nature. That nature that we've talked about in Jacob, that nature that we've talked about in Adam and Eve, we have that very same nature which needed to be changed dramatically just like Jacob's nature was changed dramatically. From wrestling with God and men to get what he wanted to trusting God to wrestle for him and give him what he had promised. We need that same dramatic change in our nature. So what happened? Well, the God-man, after he was raised from the dead and glorified, he gave new life to us as well through his Holy Spirit. He gave to us a life of faith where we would depend on him to do for us and give to us what we want most. What he already promised to do, and what he already bought for all of his people. Jesus' words, John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life, and what else? That they may have it more abundantly. What did I say to you is the commonality between all human beings? We want abundant life. We want to be happy. We want pleasure. We don't want chaos. We want peace. We don't want to be afraid. We want pleasure that, that is there all the time. It lasts. It's not here today and gone tomorrow. It's not, it's, it's not the pickup truck that uh, Josh got a great pickup truck and the axle's already out of it. That's, that's what happens to us. We, 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 we were always looking for, for happiness and pleasure, but, but everywhere we try to find it, it goes away. That's our commonality. We, we all do that. We are looking for abundant life, real life, constant life, unending life. And Jesus says, that's why I came. I came that they could have life and have it more abundantly. And that is the why of incarnation. I'll never explain to you how God can become a man. He did, 
But I can't explain to you why the Son of God became a man. And we just talked about that. That they may have life. That they may have it more abundantly. So let me just say this to you. Don't get caught in this annual trap of looking at nativity scenes and thinking only about the what of incarnation. I'm not saying the miraculous conception and birth of Jesus Christ isn't important. It is. It is all important. We're talking about it on Wednesday night as we go through the servant songs of of, of Isaiah. You find the father speaking of his son as his servant. And you find the son speaking of the father as being his servant. And last Wednesday night, we had a wonderful time talking about God becoming a man and what that meant for the son of God, the the humiliation and the humility that, that his father would now have to uphold him. That is important. It is all important. But if we stop there and we don't think as much about, the, about why the Father chose to send the Son and why the Son chose to come as a man and how the incarnation saves us from our sins, we will end up denying God the worship that he intended and that he deserves for the glory of his grace. And we will open ourselves up to our flesh and that ever-present tendency to try to be God and to renew the wicked pursuit of abundant life our own ways. And if you are a child of God, if you are here and you are trusting in Jesus Christ, let me just say, don't go back there. Don't go back to that place where you used to try to get abundant life yourself, your own way. Even trying to manipulate God sometimes to do it. It wouldn't be hard to find a church in this city right now where you could go and they would, they would teach you how to pray and speak to God, where you can trust in the fact that God's going to make you prosperous on this earth with lots of money and never getting sick. Woo, that's what we want, right? We have that tendency to even try to manipulate and strong arm God to get what we want most. Don't go back there. Do not. That is so evil that it earns the death penalty. Just keep following Emmanuel. Keep trusting Emmanuel. God with us, the Son of God who came to free us from the penalty of that idolatry and to change our minds so that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus is the God who made this promise of abundant life to all who repent and believe in him. Keep following Emmanuel, God with us, for paradise all of eternity. And if you were here this morning and you say, well, I'm still there. I'm still Jacob before he ended up limping. I'm still Jacob trying to to formulate this life on my own, my own ways. Let me just remind you once again, it is sinful to do that. It makes you an enemy of God. You are cut off from God when you live that way. He considers those to be wicked works. And the death penalty is, is the end result of walking down that road. So turn to Emmanuel. He's the one who can set you free and give you his promise, his way, just like he did for Jacob. Let me read these two verses in closing. Kevin read them earlier. The angel said to the shepherds this, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. God with us, Emmanuel. Let's pray. Father, we are so glad that we can see your son as the substitute, as the human savior, all through scripture. We see, we see him all the way back in the garden where you killed those animals to make skins, to cover the, the, the shame from Adam and Eve's, Eve's sin. We see him there. Already, Now we see him in Genesis chapter 32 with Jacob wrestling this God-man by the river. And not just a picture, not just a shadow, not just a type. But here is the God-man, the Son of God himself, already appearing as a man before he did it eternally as Jesus Christ. And why? Oh, for the very same reason he would come later. Later would be the one to die die on the cross and be raised from the dead, but but already he's coming to to rescue one of your own from, from sin. He's already coming to change 
Jacob, to set him free from what he had always been. He had been that deceiver, that, that manipulator, that conniver, the one who was, had all of these selfish ambitions and tried to get them his own way. Whatever that meant, he would, he would do anything to get it. And, and the God-man comes and changes him, sets him free from the results of that. He had made his brother so mad that his brother wanted to kill him. And the God-man comes and his brother no longer wants to kill him. He loves him. He misses him and, and, and wants to help take him back to the promised land. And as for that nature, now Jacob limps off unlike before. Still there, but unlike before. And now here's a man trusting in God to overrule on his behalf. God to be faithful to, to your promises. Well, Father, that's what we all need. And I am so glad that, that we see pictures and types and shadows and even pre-incarnate appearances of the Son that show us that you do that and how you do that. And we are so glad that we now live on the other side of the cross. Just in Sunday school this morning, thinking about where the Jews had been with all of these promises of the coming Messiah, but he hadn't come yet, so it was guesswork. Who will he be? When will he come? How will he come? And they had such a convoluted picture in their mind of what that was going to look like, and they missed him when he came. We live on the other side. He has come. And you have, he has sent out his apostles to explain exactly who he is and exactly what he did and exactly what comes to those who follow him. Thank you so much for providentially bringing us about at this time and place. But Father, we can also miss it. We can also miss him. And that desire within us for that life of prosperity and pleasure is so strong that we are so easily led astray. Our flesh does it to us. The world feeds that. The enemy, the enemy, is behind that, coming up with objects and, and experiences and promises and, and fool's gold all the time because he knows we are so weak and we are so susceptible. So, Father, I pray that you will use passages like Genesis chapter 32 to keep our mind, our eyes, fixed on the one who is the Savior, Christ the Lord. The only one, the one that you chose, Behold my servant, my elect one. This is the one you chose, the only one who could do this. And you promised exactly what he was going to do. Keep our eyes fixed on him. And the more we look at him, the more I, pr I pray that you will help us to see glory. You will help us to see in him what it is our hearts long for, ache for. This is what we're always pursuing, but we don't know what we're pursuing. It's, it's meant to be him. And he can provide everything we long for. He, he can do it now, and he will do it for all of eternity. Use this passage to fix our attention on Emmanuel, God with us. And I pray it all in his name. Amen.